in our last conversation, I spoke about the relationship between pharma and uh, d doctors and the potential impact it was having the transforming our field and, and possibly the reason why we got here where we got, you know, with all the absurdity of our field. And during that uh, same conversation, I spoke about a Dr. Joseph Bitterman, who's, um, according to New York Times in 2009, um, was the world's most prominent advocate of diagnosing bipolar disorder in even the youngest children and of using antipsychotic medicines to treat it. Um, the, also, New York Times a year before had an article about a, a 40 fold increase in the uh, diagnosis of uh, pediatric bipolar disorder. Well, that information comes from a paper by Olson and collaborators published on Archives of General Psychiatry in 2007 um, that says that uh, it's called The National Trends in the Outpatient Diagnosis and Treatment of Bipolar Disorder in Youth. And um, what that paper found was that in, from, so up 94 to 95, um, office-based uh, visits associated with the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, pediatric bipolar disorder, were 25 per 100,000 people. So that was 94 to 95, 25 per 100,000 people. And then in 2002 to 2003 was 1,003 of those office visits were associated with um, uh, pediatric bipolar per 100,000 people. So from 25 per 100,000 people to 1,003 per 100,000 people. And that's referring to uh, visits associated with the diagnosis of pediatric bipolar disorder. And, um, and then, you know, the paper goes about saying that uh, uh, there's uh, enough or significant evidence of misdiagnosis uh, and that contrasts with some papers that say that is under diagnosis. And, um, and pretty much wraps up saying we have to figure this diagnosis thing a little bit better. Well, yes, our di we don't really have diagnosis in psychiatry, not the way that we understand diagnosis in the, f the, the rest of the medical field. Let me try to explain that. The SM is a, a, a manual of full of topographic description of behavior. You see, when we talk about diagnosis in the rest of the medical field, we're talking about a, a line of causation. So you're going to say diabetes. Uh, no, you're going to say some symptom of diabetes, vision loss or uh, acantosis nigricans, or, you know, like the, that black discoloration around the neck. And you're going to go like, okay, what's causing this? Oh, high blood sugar. What's causing this? Oh, Langerhurst cells, I don't know what, pancreas. What's causing that? Oh, some autoimmune. What's causing that? Lifestyle, obesity. What's causing that? You know, so, so there's, a, there's a linear uh, causation of factors. While in psychiatry, what we have is, is what we call a tautology, and, and which means how do you know this person has schizophrenia? Well, because he hears voices. Why does he hear voices? Well, because he has schizophrenia. But how do you know he has schizophrenia? because he hears voices. So, so DSM is not really, with exception of dementia, is not really a um, diagnostic manual. It's more of a topographical description of different presentations. It would be the equivalent of, for example, in the medical field, they also have syndromes like fibromyalgia. You know, how do you know this person has fibromyalgia because he has pain, these points on his body? Well, why does he have this pain? Because he has fibromyalgia. That's a syndrome. We don't know what's causing it. Whatever hypothesis you may think you, you have. But um, so that's what psychiatry is. It's just a bunch of fibromyalgias in the sense that it's just a bunch of descriptions of a presentation that is not really associated with uh, any identifiable causation. So, so far, we have failed to elicit in research any evidence that there is a biological disease underlying these uh, clusters of symptoms, the syndromes that we have described in the DSM. We don't have, we haven't, fa we have failed miserably to find something that you can 
and you know, okay, you're gonna say, oh, but there's some, some evidence, some, you know, yeah, I, I get it, I get it, I get it that it's fair, and we should keep looking for the biology of it. Fair, all, all good, but we haven't found one determinant per syndrome. We haven't found any sufficient, necessary or sufficient biological identifiable thing for a diagnosis. You can have, oh, family history. You can have uh, someone present manic without a family history, and you can have someone that will never have mania with a family history. And then there's all these candidate genes, but so far we have failed to have a lab to distinguish, for example, in childhood bipolar or ADHD. Um, you still don't have a lab to say, okay, this kid is doing poorly in school and at home because he's a victim of abuse or because uh, he was born with a specific attentional trait, so to speak. Um, in the absence of those things, it's fair to say that whatever presentation we have could be the result of a it could be a functional presentation. How can I ex explain this? If you do a biopsy of the brain and of the legs of Usain Bolt, and you do a biopsy of my brain and my legs, it's unlikely that you're going to be guessing which one of us is faster based on the biopsy. Because that's just not enough to explain the whole ability to run, the whole years of training, how long his legs are, how strong he is, and things like that. So, you know, if you think about it, it's quite reductionist to expect to find one biological thing to determine these things. Not surprisingly, we haven't found. So the criticism that we have to figure our diagnostic criteria better, because we would hope our diagnostic criteria is actually representing an underlying entity. But so far, with the exception of intoxication and um, um, dementias, we, ha we haven't succeeded in anything in our field. In addition to that, when it comes to bipolar disorder, most symptoms are a continuation of, of average behavior. Most of them are a continuation of average behavior. And we don't have any symptoms that are absolutely ex exclusive of mania. And this is about adults. I'm still talking about adults. So, so on top of those limitations, and we saw, I, 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 in our previous conversation, we spoke about um, the relationship between the DSM task forces and the doctors involved in the process on DSM-4 and the pharmaceutical company, um, which, you know, makes me very suspicious. But um, on top of all the limitations we have, we added the concept of spectrum. Now, once you add the concept of spectrum, anything can be a diagnosis now. Any human experience, any human trait. And I'm not going to get into the merits of uh, discussing normality, but anything we do could be part of a spectrum of a problem. And it's easy to see that more diagnosis would reflect in more drug use. And in fact, it did, obviously. But let me go back. Let's see if we, if we understand how bipolar, ch pediatric bipolar disorder used to be understood as this very rare and, and highly impairing condition. And uh, from there, it became this, it feels like every kid has. I mean, having a history of bipolar disorder used to mean something during a psychiatric interview. Now it doesn't, because everybody freaking has it. So what do you make of that? So let's see if we can paint a picture of how that progression happened. So I selected a few a few papers and, and then I kind of uh, trimmed down so it wouldn't be too long of a conversation. Um, but we go back to 2006 with an editorial by Dr. Biederman um, called The Ev Evolving Face of Pediatric Mania in Biological Psychiatry 2006. And he says, although the validity of an early onset form of bipolar disorder 
or pediatric whiteboard disorder, um, has been debated. A growing number of empirical studies and extensive reviews of the literature, and then he quote, quotes uh, an author, are ama amassing evidence for this diagnosis in children and adolescents. adolescents. Um, and then he says the body of work suggests that pediatric bipolar is a disabling condition, um, and then speaks about affective behavioral dysregulation, aggressiveness or aggression, irritab severe irritability, and a chronic course. And then here's the, 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 the interesting part. Epidemiological studies estimate that at least 1% of youth may be affected, and that's uh, a paper by Lewison uh, from 95. So a very serious researcher. And the clinical studies document that up to 20% of psychiatrically referred children and adolescents satisfy criteria for bipolar. So here we go. The claim of the 1% is like, okay, if we have bipolar disorder, it used to be 2% prevalence disorder, right? If half of those folks started to have symptoms in childhood, that's why you have about 1% kind of goes unnoticed, that claim. When you say that one out of five or 20% of kids looking for help with their parents satisfy criteria, now it starts looking like propaganda. It starts looking like propaganda. Why? Because the diagnosis is absolutely, it's just a description, you know, with all the limitations it has. So all you need is availability bias. You know, all you need is a group of people looking for the diagnosis, and you're going to call every behavioral problem that a kid has. And I'm going to continue to make my point later with a, with a scale uh, of a pediatric mania, so to speak. Um, so, you know, that claim is already looking like propaganda. So then from there, we jump to 2022 with a paper by Wozniak and Bitterman called uh, Findings from a Pilot Open Label Trial of N-Acetylcysteine for the Treatment of Pediatric Mania and Hypomania. And it's the, the, the paper is not even about prevalence, okay? It's just from 2006 to 2022. And it's, it's, that's, was, that's in uh, BMC Psychiatry. And it says, due to its high prevalence, that's how, the, okay, in the introduction, of 1 to 3% in national and international samples and morbidity, pediatric bipolar disorder represents a serious public health concern. Totally looks like propaganda. And then they quote four papers to justify that 1 to 3%. The first one, the first reference is Bitterman himself, you know, the 1.6 million guy the guy that got 1.6 million from Johnson and Johnson, um, um, and it was a special communication um, about a roundtable. And I actually scrutinized the authors of the roundtable and their connections with pharma, but it was a roundtable. So this is what the roundtable concluded. Discussion re resulted in agreement of two basic definitions. Phenotypes that fit DSM-4, bipolar disorder 1, bipolar disorder 2 criteria, and um, phenotypes that encompass more heterogeneity, basically bipolar disorder NOS, and include children, which is tr just an expansion of the diagnosis NOS, right? Um, and include children who do not meet DSM-4 cr criteria, but who are still severely impaired by symptoms of mood instability. Do you see where this thing is going? I, I don't think I have. I don't think I have to explain anymore, right? Um, and they added that uh, uh, bipolar NOS, no, not otherwise specified, which was our previous unspecified, right? Could be used as a working diagnosis. So it's it's a paper, it's a consensus saying, you know what? Go ahead, diagnose with bipolar not otherwise uh, uh, specified uh, the kids, right? Because that's sufficient to justify the harmful treatments that we, that we use. Then the second study is by Lewison, bipolar disorders in a community sample of older adolescents, prevalence, phenomenology, com comorbidity, and course. Very serious paper, very serious group of researchers. Um, the lifetime prevalence, this is what it says, the lifetime prevalence of bipolar disorder primarily bipolar 2 disorder and cyclothymia was approximately 1%. All included, right? Even cyclothymia. 
God knows what that is. An additional 5.7% of the sample reported having experienced a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated expenses of, or irritable mood, even though they never met criteria for bipolar disorder. All right, that sounds good, right? Kids behaving funny, fine, solid. I'm going to skip the third reference and go to the fourth, that is an updated meta-analysis of epidemiologic studies of pediatric bipolar disorder by Van Meter. And that's from 2019, Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. Uh, and they said in this uh, meta-analysis that the weighted average prevalence of bipolar spectrum disorder was 3.9. So bipolar spectrum, right, the whole gamut uh, of behaviors, because now we already have the spectrum concept and um, that allows a lot of inclusion. And she, the answer is like, well, they go with 3.9%. Um, and also that the, the, the world prevalence of bipolar itself would be 1.8%. So you see migrated from 1% in 95, all things included to just bipolar being 1.8, but not, not all is lost. Peter Perry, Dr. Peter Perry and his team published a review of that review. So this is what they said. Um, it's called Pediatric Bipolar Disorder Rates Are Still Lower Than Claimed, a Re-Examination of Eight Epidemiological Surveys Used by an Updated Meta-Analysis. Meta-Analysis, referring to Van Meter's meta-analysis. And what they found is that According to the Cochrane Handbook of, for Systematic Reviews of Interventions, the heterogeneous community surveys were arguably unsuitable for statistical meta-analysis and warranted a narrative analysis. And once they do it, what they found is that the pediatric bipolar disorders rates, pe pediatric bipolar disorder rates were substantially lower than 1.8%. And they conclude that bipolar disorder is very rare in childhood and rare in adolescence. This, the most important pediatric bipolar disorder as a diagnostic construct fails to correlate with adult bipolar disorder and, and the term should be abandoned. What they're trying to say is that we used to think we knew what this description of bipolar was. And then we look to kids and we say, okay, these kids are bipolar, but do they become adults with bipolar? And their claim is that there's, there's a failure to correlate like that, right? Are they right? right? They are, and I'm gonna show in a second, because that leads to, to the question, what is the problem? How, what kind of motivation the field, other than, the, what kind of motivation our field has that leads to this kind of expansion of diagnosis? In a, in a, in a sort of, other than, of course, uh, having $1.6 million as incentive, um, which we know uh, it's not that rare, you know, in, in, the term, in, in the sense that a lot of doctors do have partnerships with pharmaceutical companies and that the expansion of these diagnoses do benefit pharmaceutical companies. Um, but how come, what is the factor, what are the factors that lead to this kind of a transformation in the field that is not warranted or wanted? And, you know, so I think one of the things is that we're all very well-intentioned professionals, but we got to commute, we got to see patients. We spend something like 60% of our times, uh, uh, time attending to uh, paperwork. Um, uh, culturally, people have, uh, we, we like, we used to believe that culturally, I used to believe that, that patients are expecting medications. And I assure you that's, that's not true. We have been, as a society, we are absolutely ripe to review psychiatry practices. Um, and then you have to see a patient every 15 minutes, some patients every 20. I'm, I'm, I'm privileged that I work with it different model that is financially sustainable, but, but um, I, I have slight less pressure in that regard and allows me to use a different model. And what I'm finding is that patients are done 
with all the medication trials. You know, they, they, they can see through the smoke at this point. So we are in a very ripe moment to implement changes in our field. Um, but I think those factors, the extra, you know, being extra busy, and maybe I'm not sure if our field selects you know, going through medical school or psych nurse practitioner school uh, or masters, whatever you want to call it, um, requires a fair amount of compliance. And if you stop to question everything you've seen, you know, there's just not time to memorize everything you have to memorize to actually take a test, which is what we are actually good at, taking tests. So we end up not having a lot of room for critical thinking or for in-depth reading and we became maybe this title uh, and abstract reading profession because of the pace of it. Um, and then we may, maybe we were, I don't, betrayed by people that were in key positions in academia because of their partnership with pharmaceutical companies. Um, but things like so I'm going to show you now the child rating main scale by uh, Pavolori or Pavolori, P Pavolori, I don't know how to say that. Um, a scale like that should have caught our attention before, but it didn't. Maybe because we're too busy, maybe because we don't have what the, the time and chance to actually have critical thinking, I don't know. But here's the child rating main scale uh, parent version. Does your child have periods of feeling super happy for hours or days at a time, extremely wound, wound up and excited, such as feeling on top of the world? Yeah, like nearly every child that I have met, I would say yes, myself when I was a kid, my son, you know? P picture a seven-year-old kid having the time of his life, feeling irritable, cranky, or mad for hours or days at a time, yeah, yeah, I think kids do that a lot. Think that he or she can be anything or do anything. I would hope so. I would hope my son can think he can be or do anything, except, you know, short of flying off the window after watching Superman. Um, beyond what is usual for that age, you know, so a kid says he wants to be a scuba diver and a... Um, uh, a fireman um, so it says your leader basketball player rap singer millionaire or a princess I'm not kidding this is what this is what this thing says think of he or she can be any can be anything or do anything and they included princess there's no age limit okay princess S something wrong with a girl that thinks she can be a princess when she grows up. Believe that he or she has unrealistic abilities or powers that are unusual and may try to act upon them, which causes trouble. Kids causing trouble because they think they can do things they cannot. Very weird. Never heard about it. Need less sleep than usual, yet does not feel tired the next day. <laughs> A kid feeling tired. Have periods of too much energy. Have periods when she or he talks too much or too loud or talks a mile a minute. I'm not kidding. This is the child mania rating scale. Okay? It's a kid that talks too much. It's a symptom. It must be sick. The kid must be sick. Rush around uh, doing things nonstop. Yeah, makes, makes you think of ADHD, which is another, you know, loose construct, have trouble staying on track and it's easily drawn to what's happening around him or her. Make up your mind. Do many more things than usual. Usually than whom? Or is unusually productive or highly creative? A kid that is highly creative, I'm telling you, we should drug these kids. Behave in a sexually inappropriate way. Talks dirty, exposing, playing with private parts, obviously never read for Freud, masturbating, making sex phone calls, that's heavy, but doesn't specify the age, humping on dogs, if I see that, I'll be concerned, playing sex games, what age, 14, 15, 
I mean, how old are you now? You're listening to me. We, we, we know society changed drastically in that sense. Right? The other, I'm not, not going to go there too far. Go and talk to strangers inappropriately. It's more socially outgoing than usual. So far, I would say 9 out of 10 kids that I have met would meet criteria for bipolar if I take this thing into account. Do things that are unusual for him or her that are foolish or risky. Jumping off, weight, uh, jumping off heights, ordering CDs with your credit cards, giving things away. I can think of another 10 things that will make a, a kid do that. Not have a sense of property, being overly generous, calling things, you know, uh, funny that they say CD makes me think of conduct disorder, which is also a loose construct. Have rage attacks, intense and prolonged uh, temper tra tantrums. M never saw a kid have that. Certainly every kid that I have, that I, that I saw having a temper tantrum is clearly very sick and probably should put in a psychiatric unit. Uh, he cracks jokes or pun more than usual, laughs loud or acts silly in a way that is out of the ordinary. To whom? I don't know what to make of this thing. Experience rapid mood swings. Yes, kids do that. Call, you know, have a name in our field for that is emotional regulation. And then I have th we have three icons. Have suspicious or strange thoughts. All right, something starting to look like something concerning here. Hear voices that nobody else can hear, assuming we're good at telling the difference between imaginary and asymptomatic. Is there a difference? I don't know. See things that nobody else can see. Again, same thing. So it's easy to see that a whole scale was made out of things that most kids do. And if we look at that and we don't share any critical thought, don't, don't shed any critical thinking over this thing, we're going to start diagnosing virtually every kid. It's surprising for me that it's only 3.9% according to those papers. And now I'm going to tell you about uh, a paper of uh, Tishzen. Uh, I, the names will kill me. I, I can't. Tishzen, Wichen, Lieb, Mangler's um, Psych Psychological Medicine, 2010. Okay. Um, it's called, uh, oh well, it's a paper. This is what they did. They took a group of 1,022 kids when they were 14 years old to 17 years old. And they started to follow them. So they assessed them with the Munich Composite International Diagnostic Interview. Just to see if they would answer, you know, they send an interviewer to your house. And by the way, a lot of research has been doing like that, which is makes you question the validity of it. Very, big um, uh, assertion make based on it but you go to people's houses and you check the boxes do you have this do you have this and you go checking right so um they did a, a tease at a time zero like the first assessment then they repeated 1.6 years later and then they repeated 3.4 years later and then they repeated 8.3 years later and uh, there was a range of 7.4 to 10.6 years of follow-up um, of, of this uh, thousand uh, kids group uh, and they also paired the results of those interviews with a reported stress and um, or distress I should say and hospitalization or care in general and um, what they found is that at, uh, at, at some points during the, the process, they totaled uh, 1,500 1500 kids would meet criteria for mania, according to that research. 1,500 kids per 100,000, all right? So 1,500 kids per 100,000 would meet criteria for mania, according to that research. But by the time they turned 22, it, dro it dropped to 300. And only a very small portion of them needed care or reported significant distress over it. In other words, um, 
the the title is is um, the title of the article is that this mania phenotype is um, does basically it says that it doesn't uh, it's a common thing and it doesn't translate into bipolarity later in life uh, and you can always email me for references for some reason I didn't put here and it's going to take too long to find the article in my computer now so another way to look at this paper that found 1,500 per 100,000 people, kids meeting criteria for mania, and then by the time they're 22, only 300 did. It's, it's either, um, if we want to believe that mania is an entity as opposed to just a verb, right? It's an entity as opposed to just something that some people can do, then the criteria that we use to diagnose it in kids does not reflect it because it's resolving itself alone. Because either that or we're really talking about a spontaneous resolution of 80% of the cases. Now, an another fairly controversial idea would be to stop making up stuff to justify poisoning kids with medications like Risperdal. Um, but then you're going to say, okay, What's the worst that can happen, Rod, if you have a bred kid causing a lot of trouble to uh, his parents in school? Um, what is the worst that can happen if you give him Risperdal or any other uh, medication of that uh, category? Um, so I have an answer for you, and the answer is by Wayne uh, Ray, PhD and collaborators, Association of Antipsychotic Treatment with Risk of Unexpected Death among children and youths. This is uh, JAMA Psychiatry, 2018. Here's the question they want to ask her. Are antipsychotic medications prescribed for children and youth without psychosis associated with increased risk of unexpected death or deaths other than from injuries or suicide without prolonged hospitalization? And they got their cohort uh, from the Tennessee Medicaid enrollment pharmacy hospital patient and nursing home files and was augmented with uh, linkages to death certificates. Um, the cohort included children and young adults, 5 to 24, enrolled in Medicaid between January 99 to December 2014. And they included new users that never filled prescriptions uh, for antipsychotics. Um, and um, try to capture the deaths that so basically they included 188 189,000 new users of controlled medications and that's the control group and that has um, 81,000 that were on ADHD medications most frequently psychostimulants 93,000 include antidepressants most frequently serolactive uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors they have 14,000 who receive mood stabilizers, most frequently anticonvulsants. And then the, the cohort included 28,000 new users of antipsychotic medications who is received initial doses of 50 milligrams or less of chlorpromazine um, equivalents, most commonly Risperdal, with a total of 18,000 people getting um, uh, Risperdal. And, um, and that was the lower dose group. So this is what they did. And I'm sorry for if it gets too complicated, but there's no other way to explain this thing. They had two groups of kids. Well, basically three. Kids taking all kinds of meds. Kids taking antipsychotics with a dose that is equivalent, l l lower than the equivalent of 50 milligram of, of chlorpromazine. And you don't have to Google, I'm going to give you the numbers. In the other group with doses above 50 milligrams of chlorpromazine. Um, and they had uh, quetiapine, 10,000, Abilify, 7,000, Olanzapine, 5,000, in the higher dose group. Okay. Um, so, what are those? So, equivalent of 50 milligrams of chlorpromazine. Seroquel, the dose would be between 30 and 75 milligrams, pretty low. Risperdal between 0 0.5 and 1 milligram. That would be roughly equivalent to 50 milligrams of chlorpromazine. Olanzapine 2 to 2.5 milligrams. It's a very low dose. 
and held those 0 0.75 to 1 milligram. That's roughly equivalent to 50 milligrams of chlorpromazine. So we had a group taking those doses are lower and another group taking those doses are higher. So they found that the risk of death in the higher dose group was 80% greater than in the control group. In the higher dose group, the adjusted hazard ratios for unexpected death was significantly increased, 3.51 times fold increased, 3.5 fold increase in uh, risk of unexpected death, with 45 excess deaths per 100,000 people per year in that group. Here comes the punchline. The difference was primarily attributable to the increased incidence of unexpected deaths in the high dose group versus control group. When more detailed cause of death were examined, the high, higher dose group, because what you're going to say, well, if he was on higher doses, it's because they were sicker, because we doctors are perfect. We wouldn't give too much drug unless they really need it. So the higher dose group had an increased risk of unexpected deaths other than from an unintentional drug overdose, inclu including increased risk of death due to cardiovascular or metabolic causes. So no, we're not talking about suicides or anything like that. So to summarize what I'm trying to say is somehow interests, um, personal, financial, I don't know, led to a absurd progression of a diagnosis that justifies somehow hurting children. The diagnosis doesn't seem to have validity, doesn't seem to describe any more than normal childhood and adolescence and seems to resolve itself spontaneously by adulthood and yet we are prescribing medications that increase the risk of death of these kids. Another way of looking at this, as a profession, as a group of people practicing a profession, we overall oppose spanking, you know, we overall oppose spanking and physical punishment. But we're okay with prescribing antipsychotics for kids. We became a profession that thinks that Risperdal and Abilify are more humane than a flip-flop. And I just want to wrap up repeating the names of the people that researched and tried to stand against this thing. Because while we have a notion of doctors that are associated with pharma saying that go for this diagnosis, call it NOS, throw a, dr throw a drug in the dark, disregarding what seems to be the natural history of the, this presentation, we still have a handful of people like Dr. Wayne Race, Peter Perry, Stephen Allison that are there standing for the truth. Now, if you like this podcast, likelihood is you're also trying to stand for the truth. And I assure you, growing my audience is a very challenging, challenge, very challenging endeavor. So if you like this episode, please like it, share with people you know. Thank you for listening. If you think I'm missing something, you can always reach me at info at NEPMI.org. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.